my pastor back in Chattanooga, where I had the privilege of serving for 11 years, one of the things he would always say to me is, Fred, we can never get away from the cross. And that's what this song is about, the power of the cross. Dr. Dr. Quills, thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. It's been a real privilege.
Thank you, Dr. Gilbert and Corral. You are such a gift to Louisiana College, and we are deeply, deeply grateful for you leading us in worship tonight. Please take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, beginning with verse 17. We're going to look tonight at the theme, Paul, a model for ministry. Acts chapter 20, beginning with verse 17. Would you please stand with me as we read God's word together? Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they came to him, he said to them, You know, from the first day I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility, with tears, and with the trials that came to me through the plots of the Jews, and that I did not shrink back from proclaiming to you anything that was profitable, or from teaching it to you in public and from house to house. I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus. And now I am on my way to Jerusalem, bound in my spirit, not knowing what I will encounter there, except that in town after town, the Holy Spirit testifies to me that chains and afflictions are waiting for me. But I count my life of no value to myself so that I may finish my course and the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. And now I know that none of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will ever see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink back from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. So be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among whom the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure savage wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock and men from among yourselves will rise up with deviant doctrines to lure the disciples into following them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for three years I did not stop warning each one of you with tears. And now I commit you to God and to the message of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. I've not coveted anyone's silver or gold our clothing. You yourselves know that these hands have provided for my needs and for those who are with me. In every way, I've shown you that by laboring like this, it is necessary to help the weak and to keep in mind the words of the Lord Jesus, for he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And after he said this, he knelt down and prayed with all of them. And there was a great deal of weeping by everyone. And embracing Paul, they kissed him, grieving most of all over his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they escorted him to the ship. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would help me to preach your word accurately and reverently and passionately for the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, tonight. Lord, I pray that truths from this Holy Scripture would penetrate our minds and hearts and would change the directions of our ministry forever. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I can hardly express how much he meant to me over the years. When I committed my life to the gospel ministry, he more than anybody else believed in me and encouraged me. As a 13-year-old preacher, he was the only one who was brave enough or crazy enough, I'm not sure which, to turn me loose in his pulpit 
Even on Sundays when he was out of town, he would pick up the phone and say, do you have anything ready? And give me an opportunity to preach God's word. In my college years, when I became confused by my dreams and aspirations and came that close to turning my back on my ministry and abandoning my call, he was the only one who loved me enough to sit down with me and shake some sense back into me. He seemed to be a model pastor. He shared the gospel faithfully. The churches that he pastored doubled and sometimes even tripled in size with a few years' time. He was a man who would preach God's word without compromise and who taught me much of what I knew about the great doctrines of the Christian faith. He was the head of my ordination council. His name is at the very top as chairman of my ordination council on my certificate that hung in my pastor's study for the years that I was a pastor. And so maybe you'll understand just a little bit how deeply I was grieved and how greatly I was confused. When I got the phone call one day saying that the allegations that he had denied repeatedly to me and to his wife were in fact true. And for years he had been in an adulterous relationship with a member of his church and had now turned his back on his family, his ministry, and everything that he believed in. And another star fell. Another hero came crashing down. And if I were honest with you, I could tell you a dozen stories that are very, very similar about men that I looked up to in the faith, men who were my heroes in the faith, who have broken the heart of God and who have left me groping for some example that I could follow after, someone that I could look up to. But I have one hero left. One hero who has yet to fail me. The Apostle Paul is a man of God whose example we can follow and we need not worry about him disappointing us or leading us astray. Tonight, I'm going to encourage you to examine the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle to the Gentiles, and make a commitment to emulate his example in preaching, in character, and in behavior. Tonight, we're going to look at the characteristics of Paul's ministry and his message as we examine his farewell speech to the Ephesian elders at Miletus in Acts chapter 20. As we have the opportunity to eavesdrop on this conversation where the seasoned Pastor Paul mentors those who are going to take his place in the church at Ephesus, we can be inspired and informed about how we are to conduct our ministries even today. And if we follow Paul's example then I am assured that we will one day stand before Christ the judge and be found faithful workmen who do not need to be ashamed because we carefully handled the word of truth and because we exhibited the character of our Savior. Paul's speech to the Ephesian elders at Miletus is packed with descriptions of the characteristics of his ministry. We don't have time to look at all of them. We're going to examine just three of those characters of his ministry before we look at characteristics of his message. First of all, Paul's ministry was characterized by passion. He says twice in this passage that his ministry was literally saturated with tears. The Apostle Paul was not a dry, dispassionate preacher who proclaimed the Word of God with a flippant, take-it-or-leave-it attitude. He was a man who was on fire with passion for the Jesus Christ. He was a man who tearfully called men and women to repentance of sin and faith 
in the Lord Jesus. Like Jeremiah before him, he was a weeping prophet, and his heart broke and bled over those who rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. We see this in Romans 9 where he says, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. Not only did Paul weep for the lost and unrepentant, he wept over the sin that shamed the name of God in those who claim to be the people of God. In 2 Corinthians 2, Paul refers to a difficult letter he had to write to the church at Corinth to call those people to repentance in the face of heinous sin. And he said, I wrote out of great distress and anguish of heart with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. Paul wept with concern over the doctrinal error that threatened to creep into the church and destroy its ministries. We see that here in Acts chapter 20, where he says in verse 31, Be on your guard against false teachers. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Paul's ministry was a tearful ministry. And God seldom blesses a tearless one. I was puzzled by the behavior of Grady as I preached in the revival in Stanfield, North Carolina. He was the first heckler I had ever encountered as a preacher. Night after night, he would come in, he would sit on the back row while I preached, and he would glare, and he would scoff, and literally laugh out loud. Everybody in the congregation was so distracted by him that no one could hear a single thing that he said. I kept on preaching night after night. We got to the fourth night of the revival, and I was so frustrated, I didn't know what to do. So I spoke to the pastor, and he and I agreed that after church that night, we would stay at the church, and we would kneel at the altar, and we would pray for Grady's soul. We prayed for hours till late into the night and sensed in our hearts that God was going to do something dramatic, went home and got just a few hours rest before the next day of ministry began. And that night I stepped behind the pulpit eagerly, expecting God to do something, expecting God to save Grady. But as I preached, he just sat back and scoffed and laughed again. And my heart broke for him. And partly because of my concern for his soul and frankly partly because we had been up most of the night praying and I don't do very well when I don't get enough sleep. Before I knew it, I broke down in the pulpit and I was sobbing uncontrollably. I don't cry pretty. I don't know about you, but I am a mess when I cry. And I could not regain my composure. I tried to spit out the words and I couldn't even say them clearly enough for people to understand. And so finally I closed the service, walked down and sat on the front pew thinking I had failed God miserably, embarrassed and ashamed. The pastor decided to extend the invitation anyway. The first line of the first stanza of the hymn, Grady burst out into the aisle, made his way to front and center, threw his arms around the neck of the pastor and with great tears repented of his sin and confessed faith in Jesus Christ as his God, Savior, and King. And we were blown away. The pastor talked to him a little while after the service and then he came over to me and he said, Chuck, I asked Grady, what changed? Night after night, 
You have laughed at the gospel. You have scoffed at the gospel. And tonight your heart is broken and you come to faith in Christ. What happened? And he said, when that man broke down in the pulpit and began to sob, I suddenly realized that what he was preaching was very, very real to him. And it suddenly became very, very real to me. And suddenly I began to replay the sermons that I had preached earlier in the week. And I wasn't happy with what I discovered. I had kind of a standard fare of revival sermons, and I had preached every one of them a half dozen times. I could preach them from rote memory without looking at a note. I could preach them mindlessly, almost robotically. And to my shame, I probably had. I had failed to show in my preaching that I treasured the precious gospel of Jesus Christ. And so it should have been no surprise to me that a man like Grady would fail to treasure it too. And that night, on my face before God, I repented of every dry-eyed, cold-hearted sermon I had ever preached and said, God, please let me preach with a holy unction that shows people I believe what I'm saying. And that is my prayer for all of us tonight. That we will treasure the gospel of Jesus Christ and we will love souls and they won't doubt it when they hear us proclaim God's word. The Apostle Paul was a man whose ministry was characterized by passion. He was a man whose ministry was characterized by boldness. Twice in this passage, Paul insists that he never silenced or compromised God's truth. He said in verse 20, I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you. In verse 26, I have not hesitated once again to proclaim. The word hesitate means to shrink back in fright, to recoil in fear, to cower with intimidation and Paul said I never did it my concern when I preached to you was to proclaim a holy thus saith the Lord and not be afraid of the human reaction he didn't allow his fear of people to cause him to back down or shut up he recognized that sometimes The message that people least want to hear is the message they most need to hear. And sometimes you have to preach it even when it hurts. Verse 20 is closely tied in our text to verse 19, showing us that even in the face of Jewish opposition, Paul didn't sidestep those elements of the gospel that were offensive to his human audience. He knew that the message of the cross was a stumbling block to the Jew and foolishness to the Greek, but the cross was still the focal point of his gospel. He recognized that preaching Jesus Christ as God and King was blasphemy to the Jew and insurrection to the Roman, but he would not compromise that truth. Sadly, in our day, many a ministry is characterized by compromise. We've lost our prophetic voice because we have become more concerned about being politically correct than we are about being biblically correct. Forgetting that the friend of the world is the enemy of God, we bend over backwards to silence any truth to compromise any doctrine that might be offensive to the unregenerate mind. Consequently, many of our sermons have become so sugary sweet, so devoid of Holy Spirit conviction 
that the devil himself is not offended by them. We lack the holy boldness to confront sin, to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. More concerned about keeping our jobs than pleasing the master. We have traded the office of the shepherd for the role of the hireling. But the Apostle Paul was no false teacher who set out to tickle his listeners' itching ears. He was a man of God, and his commitment was to aim to please the heavenly audience, not the human audience. And so he could write in 1 Thessalonians 2, we are not trying to please men, but God, the God who tests our hearts. We are not looking for praise from men, not from you or from anyone else. May our ministries be characterized by such boldness. But not only was Paul's ministry characterized by passion and by boldness. His ministry was characterized by great sacrifice. First of all, he embraced physical sacrifices. We read about those in verses 22 through 24 when he briefly describes the difficulties he had faced and would face, the harsh and bitter persecutions, the grueling imprisonments, the coming execution by beheading by order of the Emperor Nero. Not only did he suffer physically, and by the way, those are detailed in 